titled Grass Gone Bad, New Invasive Species of Concern to BC's Grasslands. We're delighted to have Becky Brown with us today to share her expertise. Becky is an invasive plant specialist with the BC Ministry of Forests, Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. Becky will talk about several new invasive plant species that pose significant threats to BC's grasslands, including how to identify and report them and the most likely places they will occur. Some good news today, this webinar has been approved in BC for one continuing education credit towards pesticide applicator certification. I'll be letting you know how to apply for this credit at the end of the webinar. I hope everybody had a chance to sign in early and get any technical problems worked out. If you're still experiencing any problems, write a note to us in the chat box and we'll see if we can assist you. For those that could not attend today, know that the webinar is being recorded and a PDF will also be available. Everybody has been muted so you should only be able to hear myself and Becky. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the chat box in the right-hand column of your screen. Becky will be taking time at the end of the presentation to discuss questions, if there's enough time to do so. When you put a question in, please add a question mark at the end of the question, as this program recognizes and separates questions for us. Thanks so much. If we run out of time to address all of your questions, we'll send out the questions and the answers by email. To begin with, we'd like to find out who is here and where you all work or what your areas of interest are. Please type your name and workplace or your area of interest in the chat box and we can review them while I'm introducing Becky. Thanks so much. All right. At this point, I'm pleased to give a warm welcome and introduction to Becky Brown, an invasive plant specialist with the BC Ministry of Forests, Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. Becky is a professional agrologist who has been working in natural resource management throughout BC for the past 20 years. Her work has focused on invasive plants since 2003. Becky's primary focus is coordinating the Provincial Early Detection and Rapid Response Program, or EDRR, for invasive plants. This work includes species risk assessments, invasive plant report verifications, extent surveys, treatment trials, and establishing new permits and registrations. Becky also provides technical support to land managers working with established aquatic and terrestrial invasive plants, especially in the coastal region. Becky's joining us today from Nanaimo, BC. Her talk will help us in learning how to identify and report new invasive grassland species. As you know, invasive plants can threaten our natural resources, areas of cultural significance, infrastructure, and the health of people, animals, and the environment. We have an opportunity to avoid these risks from plants that are new or not yet present in the province by identifying them early and containing and eradicating them. Becky will focus on several new invasive plant species that pose significant threats to BC's grasslands. At this point, I will pass the mic over to you, Becky. I hope everybody enjoys the webinar. Great, thanks a lot, Sue. Um, well, I'm pleased to be here today. I guess I have a bit of a captive audience. <laughs> anyway, um, just actually before we get started, I just wanted to say, if you happen to hear howling far off in the distance, it's just my kids, they're fine. My husband is with them, but I, we shouldn't hear anything, but that's just a <laughs> caveat before we get, before we get going. Um, so I, I just want to provide a bit of context before we get started here. So um, early detection rapid response, um, that's that's uh, my main focus. And um, the invasive plant portion of that, the operational um, activities related to that work are delivered through the invasive plant program within the range branch in, in Flin Row, the Natural Resource Ministry. And um, the um, EDRR plant species risk assessments and analyses, those are completed through um, the Early Detection Rapid Response Advisory, which is a subcommittee of the Inter-Ministry Invasive Species Working Group, which is a cross-ministry group um, that does more of the strategic coordination level for uh, invasive species management across all taxa uh, for the province. So let's get going here. 
So what I was hoping to cover off with you guys is uh, first of all, what is early detection rapid response? Very briefly, um, uh, to provide you a brief uh, update on the status of the EDR program in BC as of today. And then we'll get into the bad grasses. Um, who are they, what are they, where are they? And, and what can you do if you find them? And then we'll talk a bit more about some other bad grasses <laughs> and then, and then uh, how to get rid of them or, or what you can do if, if you come across them. And, and I did want to mention, um, from my perspective, um, the purpose of wanting to do this webinar is because um, since 2019, we've had some pretty significant changes on the landscape in BC uh, as a result of new introductions of invasive grass and, and their presence and distribution. And, and because of that, there is a, a greater need than ever before to increase awareness of invasive grasses threatening BC grasslands and to improve our surveillance and reports on the ground. So from my perspective, that's a really big uh, reason for, for wanting to do this webinar today. So first of all, um, there's an early detection rapid response plan for the province, and this guides the steps that we take in managing uh, species that are candidates for eradication um, across all taxa. So um, this plan is broken into six major steps. Um, and, and actually, you know, a really good thing about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic going on is that the general population is now all of a sudden using terminology that we've been using uh, to deal with plants. I mean, obviously public health, it's a different scale, but um, the approach is actually quite similar. So first of all, um, early detection. So um, doing surveillance, active surveillance, looking for these um, EDR candidate species. And then once they're reported, um, uh, responding to that. And then that moves us to step two, which is the identification. So we, we do uh, species site verifications either by in-site visits, uh, receiving pressed voucher specimens, or sometimes we can even do it by picture depending on the species. And then step three, the alert screening. This is where um, the candidate EDR species are typically identified and the regulatory status is, is well understood well in advance of those species first occurring in BC. But, you know, sometimes that's not the case. Um, and, and so there, those steps would need to, to be moved through quite quickly in the event that something unexpected came about. Um, in step three, the alert screening, it's also the process of, of physically delineating the extent. So identifying the perimeter of, of the actual site where is it, where is it not? And then physically containing that site. So that all happens in step three before we even get into developing a response plan. Because ultimately, if we've identified we have a high risk species in the province, we wanna make sure it's contained while we work towards figuring out how best to eradicate it. So containment's always a very high priority. Um, step four, risk assessment. Again, I mean, this is a step that in most cases is completed in advance of the species actually uh, being reported and confirmed in the province. So we have the, the risk um, identified. It's reasonably well understood. Um, in the event that a new species popped up that we weren't expecting, which happens on occasion, not very often, um, we do have a, a, a rapid course screening assessment that we can do. Um, and again, the physical containment is a priority. And then step five, we get to a rapid response. And this is where we actually get to the point of um, eradicating the species. So it identifies the methods that are gonna be most effective to eradicate the species. And um, it identifies any, any permits that might need to be established in order to do the work, um, whether it's on public or private lands, because the EDR program for the province is all lands, public and private, um, and it's land and water species. Um, and, then, and then it's the process of completing those treatments. So it identifies the frequency and the duration needed depending on on um, the viability of the reproductive parts of, of the plant. And then step six is once the plant is no longer visible on the landscape, um, then depending on the, the viability of the reproductive parts or the, or the plant propagules, that determines then the number of years that the site is monitored before it can be declared eradicated. So for example, um, seed, uh, if a plant has a, um, reproduces only by seed and the seeds are viable in the soil for six years, then we would um, go for seven consecutive years where there was no no plant found before it could be declared eradicated. So that's just a quick explanation of, of sort of how the process works for EDRR for plants. Oops. So um, what are EDR candidate species um, in regards to invasive plants? They are uh, all terrestrial and aquatic plants known to be invasive and damaging and not known to occur in BC or present in very limited amounts. So um, our focus today is going to be on grass species that are currently present in BC in limited amounts and posing risks to grassland ecosystems. Um, 
At the end of the presentation, we will be talking about a, a few species that are, are candidates for eradication, but not yet present in British Columbia. So those would be good ones to just be keeping your eyes open for as well, because at some point they will likely occur because they're in relatively close proximity to our border. And I should mention too, at the bottom of each slide, there is a web link and that takes you to the, um, the early detection rapid response page for the province. And then from there, you can go to all the different links um, on any different taxa you're interested in. So a quick update on the status of the EDR plant program in BC as of today. There are uh, currently 48 EDR candidate plant species identified in BC. Um, you'll note there's only 24 of those are currently present in BC. Um, for an update on the status of any one of those species, you can go to the link in bullet number two, and that'll tell you where we're at in the EDR process for that given species. Um, of those 48 species in total, we've completed risk assessments for 46 of them. So that's pretty good. The whole idea is we're gonna have shelf ready risk assessments for all of them. And um, 24 of those species, as I mentioned before, are currently present in BC and at some point in the EDR process. So um, that totals um, more than, well, it's actually more than 300 sites currently uh, in the EDR operations program for BC, for invasive plants. 20 of those species are under containment and working towards eradication. So that's uh, 286 sites, more than that actually. Um, and with some of those, we're in monitoring phase where you know, it's been several years of no weed found um, and we're hoping to be able to declare eradication soon. And for four of those species, they're federally regulated, which means they might be a provincial noxious weed and identified as a provincial EDR, but they're also federally regulated. So in those instances, um, the Canada Food Inspection Agency, CFIA, is the, um, the default lead. And then we work closely with them on ensuring that containment um, site verifications and eradication is occurring. Okay, so bad grass, what's so bad about it? I, I did wanna talk in general terms about some of the typical impacts that invasive grasses can have. Um, so one very major one obviously is, is the reduction of forage for livestock and wildlife. Uh, in addition, invasive grasses can displace native grassland species, including those that are rare and endangered. They can reduce crop yields and quality. And they, in some cases they can contaminate export crops, which is obviously not a good thing. They can um, increase soil erosion. In, in a lot of cases, invasive grasses might have a shallow rooting system. So while they might dominate a landscape over time, they can be uprooted quite readily. And then you have exposed soils, which obviously have all kinds of problems that go along with it. Invasive grasses can impede machinery. They can alter irrigation or wetland hydrology and flood retention capacity. And this is especially true with uh, some of the giant grasses we'll be talking about, which tend to occur primarily in riparian areas. Um, and as well with the giant grasses, they can even impede roadside visibility. Um, we don't use the term giant loosely, as you'll see. So um, what, what are some of the primary introduction and spread sources for, for invasive grasses? Um, one of the main ones is um, contaminated seed mixes. And this can be, um, you, you know, whether it's grass or whether it's uh, uh, for crops or whether it's um, or for horticulture. Um, they can also be introduced in machinery, um, in hay coming across one of the borders. Uh, livestock and wildlife um, grazing can be a source of, of mostly more localized spread where the, where the animal is consuming um, the seeds or, or the plants and then they're excreting them or where the seeds are attaching onto their fur and being moved around the landscape. Uh, in addition, uh, recreational activities can, can contribute towards in, new introductions and spread. Um, and this can include the use of quads, just hiking boots on the landscape in an infested area, mountain biking, horseback riding, camping equipment such as tents and tarps, um, fishing tackle and watercraft such as uh, hulls or, or uh, boat trailers. And of course, the, the latter two are, are more related to, to those species in riparian areas. So to go back to the um, uh, contaminated seed uh, issue again, 
Um, in order to prevent introductions of bad grasses, it's so important uh, to get into the habit of checking seed certificates. So anyone can do this. Anybody who's who's uh, planting grass on a relatively large scale, it's a good idea to get into the habit of, of requesting a seed analysis before the seed mix is blended. And what this will tell you is essentially what's in the seed. And so what you can do is, is take a look at, you know, the list of um, uh, regulated noxious weeds in BC, and you can take a look at the list of EDR candidate species. And if you see any of those um, in the analysis, you can reject the seed. And, um, you know, it's worth mentioning that under the Weed Control Act here in BC and under the Weed Control Regulation, um, the sale or distribution of any substance, such as a grass seed mix, uh, that contains a listed noxious weed is prohibited. And so a seed supplier is, is actually not allowed to distribute the noxious weeds knowingly. So um, this we found to be a really important step in intercepting new introductions to the province, especially for grasses. And this is a brochure. So the link is at the bottom of the slide for um, the full instructions of how to analyze seed certificates. Okay, so the, the main species of concern that we're gonna be focusing on uh, for grasslands today are uh, North African grass, slender false brome, European common reed, jointed goat grass, and giant reed. Um, and um, yeah, that's all I'll say on that. Let's just get into it. Okay, so North African grass. This one has uh, kept us really quite busy in the last year, especially, uh, Bentonata dubia. So um, it's native to North Africa and Europe. It's a winter annual grass. It's uh, most easily identified uh, May to June when the plants appear a really vibrant green with a reddish black node. Now here, I'm just gonna use the um, pointer to... So the reddish black node is right there, is if my arrow is showing up. Okay, and so that's a, a really nice feature you'd be looking for. And they have really unusually long ligules. So that's this spot right here. And, and, and on um, Ventanata, they, they appear one to eight millimeters long and they have quite shallow roots. So these are some, some of the things you'd be looking for in May and June. Um, the impacts include that they, they can replace perennial grasses and forbs. They can increase soil erosion, as we talked about before, because the Ventanata has quite a shallow root system. They are not palatable to the livestock and they can impede mechanical harvesting equipment um, and can actually prevent harvest, which is obviously a problem. Um, one other really important thing to note is they, they've been documented to outcompete cheat grass, which is also quite an aggressive grass that we have here in BC. So the fact that they can outcompete cheat grass is of quite a bit concern to us. It just gives an indication of aggression. Okay, so North African grass, it senesces, so it, it dies off around July, August. Um, you'll note in the, um, here, I'm gonna put my arrow again. All right, I think I got it. Um, now you'll note in the, um, the lower ons, which are here, you can see one right here, they are straight and the upper ons are bent or twisted. So this is kind of a key feature for North African grass compared to the cheatgrass, if you're trying to tell the difference. Um, and those twisted bent ons can actually unwind once they're wet and drill into the soil. They're quite good at what they do. Um, North African grass reproduces by seed and uh, its primary dispersal is in contaminated grass seed mixtures. There's a couple other sources of introduction spread too, but that's really the primary one. Um, if it's cut or grazed, it's worth knowing this plant can actually reproduce um, in inflorescence in the same growing season. So again, really good at what they do. So some of the lookalikes with the North African grass, the primary one is the cheatgrass over here on our, on our left. Now, um, I guess one thing to note is uh, it, uh, North African grass produces seed heads in the spring, two to four weeks after cheatgrass. So for differentiating between the two, that's one thing to look for as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the uh, North African grass has the bent ons. It has two to three florets or spikelets, and it flowers June to August. Now, the cheat grass has straight ons. Now, as you can see here, those ons, look at how straight they are. There's no bent or twisting form to them. Um, and they have three to six florets or spikelets, and they flower May to June. So some, some decent differences there. Um, and then um, 
yeah, I mean, really the timber oak grass and the spike oak grass, they're kind of a far second for Miss ID compared to the cheatgrass. Um, but again, good to know that, that they can be out there and mixed up. So where is uh, North African grass on the landscape in BC? Um, in 2019, let's see here. At the start of 2019, we had we had two sites. Actually, no, I'll say it. This, in 2018, we had one site, and that was limited to, to Metro Vancouver on an interchange um, along the highway. And that site is now at zero hectares. So we're in sort of a monitoring phase with that one, and it's it's not persisting, hopefully. Um, but in 2018, one new site was brought to our attention, the Gilpin grasslands around the, the Grand Forks area. And so we've been working towards um, confirming the extent of that and we've initiated treatments on that. So that's in a, um, that's in a containment phase where we're aiming to contain and reduce the population um, there. But in 2019, um, let's see here, uh, but I think it was, two or three um, uh, North African grass sites were reported to us in June by a botanist, um, thankfully. And um, following up on those sites resulted in the identification of, as you can see, I mean, quite a few more sites. So we currently, as of today, have 55 sites of, of North African grass in BC. Um, this is a really good example of the importance of surveillance and, and public awareness because Obviously, it has been here longer than 2019, and we didn't know it. Um, so the populations are, there's the Metro Van site, which, you know, we got that one under control. Um, there are 51 sites totaling 13.62 hectares in the Kootenai boundary area right now. And it's not just in one area. This is in, well, one, two, three, four, five, five different distinct areas between the Kootenai boundary and the central Kootenai area. So we are working towards um, delineating the extent. Um, those areas that are, those sites that are more discreet, it's obviously a little easier to confirm the perimeter and begin treatments on those. Those where, you know, we found it on the roadside and then you start looking and it's going up the hillside. Once they start getting into the bushlands, it, it, gets a, it takes longer to delineate the extent. So we are working on that. And um, I mean, the goal at this point is still eradication. Um, the focus for 2019 is confirming extent and containing. And so again, I mean, the importance of reporting new sites, I um, can't, uh, can't understate that. We would definitely, any any um, invasive grasses that you think you've come across or in any invasive plant at all, please do report them. And we'll be talking about reporting options at the end of the presentation. Um, the best case scenario is that something's mis ID'd and no further action is required. But um, you know, if things don't get record, reported, then, then we don't even have the opportunity to um, to, to say that. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that for now. So what are we doing about it? We've, we've drafted the risk assessment for it. Um, as I said, extent surveys are in, in progress. Containment is in progress. Um, our target audiences, ranchers, agrologists, botanists, those people who are spending a lot of time in grass, they can identify grass. Of course, we welcome reports from anybody, absolutely. All right, moving on to our next species, slender false brome. Um, it is, uh, it's not a true brome. It's native to Eurasia. It's a perennial bunch grass. It's evergreen, which is kind of a bit unusual for grasses. And it has a really nice nodding form, as you'll see in the top right image. Um, it has a fringe of fine hairs along the leaf um, and the comb margins, as you can see, hopefully my arrow's working right along here. And let's see here. The, the mature plants are really distinctly bright green. Um, as I said, it usually remains green throughout the year, which can be helpful with dif differentiating it between other species. Um, yeah, that's about, oh, I guess one other thing worth mentioning is the, the flower spikelets, um, they, they droop, as you can see in the, um, the far left image, and I've got a, a red circle drawn around the, the stalk, the pedis, the pedicle where, um, the, the spike attaches to, to the main part of the plant. Um, it, it, there is like little to no stalk there, and that's, that's really important when we're differentiating between that and some of the other grasses. 
So um, there's some really nice distinct features about the Slender Falls Broom, and it's one of those ones, once you get an eye for it, um, you know, you know you found it or not. Okay, so what is it? Um, young plants often are described as having a spider-like appearance. Um, they can grow into solid mats, 30 to 45 centimeters tall. I would not consider this to be a giant invasive grass by any means. Um, the leaf blades are flat and floppy. They're about uh, three quarters of a centimeter wide. Um, they have a fairly open leaf sheath um, that's freely releasing from the stem um, when it's pulled back. And this is part of the reason for that really nice graceful sort of drooping form. And it has a fibrous root. Um, let's see. Why is it a problem? Um, it outcompetes native forest understory and, and open grasslands. It can occur in zero to 100% canopy cover, which is kind of unusual for invasive grasses, right? And, and that's significant and worth mentioning because then obviously, you know, there's that much more potential habitat at risk, right? Um, it can increase wildfire risk and it can impede forest regeneration. Um, and at the sites we have down on the coast, um, you know, we are seeing a bit of that. So slender false brome lookalikes, the primary lookalike in its mature form is Columbia brome. And again, you can see that I've circled the, um, um, the pedicle um, on the Columbia brome. It, um, the Columbia brome has uh, the drooping spikelets similar to the, the slender false brome. It has hairy stems and leaves um, as well. I would say less hairy, but anyway, it, it, it has a long pedicle and a closed sheath, whereas the slender false brome head little to no pedicle and, and an, a relatively open sheath. Um, the velvet grass is, is typically only confused with the slender false broom as a seedling. And, and this is because velvet grass is obviously quite fuzzy, right? Um, but of course, as soon as the inflorescence emerges, they're really quite different, right? Um, and, and velvet grass too, as it gets larger, it's quite an erect um, straight grass, right? Um, with a clasping spikelet again. Um, uh, there's blue wild rye too, but again, I mean, I don't that they're, they're yeah, I don't think they're that similar. Yeah. Anyhow, so you have these slides for reference. They are archived. So if you do want to go back and have a look, feel free. That is part of the reason that I added a bunch more information than we're going into detail on here because um, I knew that some folks would be going back and taking a look. And if you have any questions at any point, feel free to contact me. Okay, where is Slender Falls Broom in British Columbia? So um, there is currently um, only one area impacted in British Columbia, which is fantastic. And it is located on the North Shore of Cowichan Lake in the Cowichan Valley on Vancouver Island, Southern um, Vancouver Island. Now um, within that impacted area, um, we've sort of broken it into 24 distinct sites, um, but it is definitely confined to one uh, compressed area. Um, it, it covers a total of 62 hectares, but this is not continuous uniform occurrence. Um, it is contained, believe it, which is awesome. And uh, control is in progress. And I mean, at this point, we're seeing, uh, we're doing two passes of treatment annually, and we're seeing really nice decrease in overall area, density, and distribution. Um, we're using uh, glyphosate um, on it, and it responds very well to that. The greatest challenge is finding the grasses, but we have some really well-trained um, crews doing the work and we're getting really good results, which is fantastic. So um, as I mentioned before, it prefers closed to semi-open temperate uh, forest, uh, but it will establish along dry open roadsides, um, cobble riparian areas and grasslands. So the site types we're seeing it in are highly variable right now, which is really, really something actually. Um, let's see here. Um, in this area where we have it, um, the primary local dispersal mechanism is actually a resident elk herd. And fortunately, we've been able to confirm that, that the elk herd's um, natural range is actually confined to the area where the slender falls brome is, is occurring. So that's really positive because up until confirming that, we were concerned that it was gonna be carried into other drainages and that that's not gonna be the case, which is fantastic. We suspect that the original site came in from the US on somebody's camping material, like a tarp or a tent, um, but it's really difficult to know with any kind of certainty. Anyhow, we're making great progress on that one. But um, 
we really want to ensure that it doesn't get elsewhere in the province. And the reason for this is um, now what we're looking at right now is um, um, the potential BC range. Um, and this is an excerpt from um, the risk assessment we completed for Slender Falls Brome for BC. Um, and what this tells us is that um, the area where it's highly susceptible to invade is the entire coastline. Um, and then it's susceptible of invading the remainder of BC grasslands, right? Well, not only grasslands, forested areas too. So um, we don't know exactly how it's going to behave um, given the opportunity to spread onto the mainland. And so um, based on our risk assessments and its behavior in the US Pacific Northwest, we're working really hard to contain it to the single impacted area. Our greatest concern is that it might get into grasslands and um, go nuts. Um, so yeah, we're in a good spot with this one right now, but definitely one to, to do your best to, to be able to identify. Okay, so what are we doing about it? We've, we've uh, drafted a risk assessment. We have completed the extent surveys and we do these annually. Um, the, the site is contained and that is the focus of our efforts first and foremost, um, focusing on, on the, the high spread areas. As you can see in the top image, I mean, that's a, a decommissioned um, rail bed actually. And um, that the entire ground cover is that slender falls from. And you can see like that's a, that's a sort of semi-open to closed area, right? and it's doing extraordinarily well there. That site actually, that picture was taken in 2015 and um, you'd be hard pressed to, to find it there now, which is very satisfying. Um, our, our, we're doing targeted surveillance. So our, our, our focus areas for this, when we're doing our extent surveys are the right of ways and then areas frequented by people, game trails and logging roads. So there is some illegal um, off-road activity in the area. So that's another vector in, in this situation. Um, we're targeting education towards um, local landowners in the area because there are some private lands that, that are part of this um, response. Uh, local fish and game clubs and uh, botanists and um, forage and range practitioners. And forest practitioners too, actually, because uh, a large portion of the infestations here are actually on private forest lands. And so we're, when we do a response, we're working in partnership with all of the, the land occupiers in order to get the response done. But the province is, is leading the response and paying for the response typically. Okay, next species, um, European common reed. Um, thank goodness I have a captive audience because we're talking about grasses for an hour. Um, so European common reed is one of our taller grasses. Um, it's a very erect perennial grass standing two to five meters tall. Um, it, it terminates in, in a really quite obvious white plume-like inflorescence. So that's the flower at the top, right? Um, it, it has a thick hollow comb, five to 15 millimeters in diameter. Um, the leaves are quite flat and stiff and they, they clasp the comb or the stem loosely with, um, um, with quite a smooth sheath. And then um, the roots are, are quite deep and dense um, rhizomes. And, and some really far reaching stolons. Now uh, in, the, uh, in the right there is a, an image of Dave Ralph. He's holding up a, a stolon that probably measures about six meters long and, and they can go quite a bit further than that. That's a picture from Vernon. Okay, so what is it? Um, seed germination in new shoots uh, can occur in spring and fall. Uh, buds form at stem nodes on stolons and rhizomes. So any part of the stem or the root that has a bud on it is capable of forming into a new plant. And this is this is what makes it really good at, at uh, spreading is through fragments, right? Uh, spreading to new areas. Um, the rhizomes can, um, they grow uh, half to four meters, uh, half of a meter to four meters uh, a year, mainly in late summer. Um, one rhizome though can measure up to 18 meters long. Uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, the inflorescence develops August to September. Uh, mature sites um, can have up to 200 stems per meter squared. And as you can see here, again, um, this site in the slide is, uh, is taken in Vernon. Um, new introductions occur mainly by seed. Uh, for established sites, uh, the spread occurs mainly through, through fragments. As we discussed, um, 
I guess one vector is reproductive parts or propagules spreading uh, in water currents, heavy machinery, um, such as say mow mowers from the roadside uh, and in contaminated soil. Um, Phragmites you're typically gonna find it not far from a water source, but it has been known to occur um, a further distance, but because the rhizomes stretch so long, I mean, 18 meters, chances are it's gonna be within, you know, 30 meters of a water source of some sort whether it's a ditch or a lake or, or wetland. Um, in 2016, new evidence of, of hybridization between the native and the introduced genotype uh, was published. So there was certainly um, some evidence of hybridization prior to that, but, um, but uh, the 2016 publication definitely firms some things up. So it's worth noting, and I guess we'll, we'll be getting into that next slide here. Um, with lookalikes, um, the primary lookalike is the native common reed or Phragmites. So there is a native Phragmites, there is an introduced Phragmites, and it's very difficult to differentiate between the two morphologically. So um, on the far left, um, that's a picture of me standing and measuring a native Phragmites stand in um, the lower mainland in the in Ladner in the Delta. Um, and so as you can see, the native one is quite robust as well, right? Um, the, let's see here, the appearance and the growth habits are, are really variable with the Phragmites, both the introduced and the native. And because of that, um, DNA analysis is really the most accurate method of differentiating between the two. And this is important, important because, I mean, if we are seeking to eradicate the introduced genotype, obviously we don't want to be treating native, native Phragmites. And the majority of Phragmites in the province is the native. And I'll be speaking about that on the next slide or in a couple of slides. Another lookalike is giant reed or Arundo donax. And this is another grass species, a giant grass species that we'll be talking about um, a little later on in the presentation. Um, another one actually that some of you might be surprised by is pampas grass. So this is an ornamental you typically find in more urban areas. Um, you know, it's a bit aggressive in its own right. I wouldn't say it's not invasive, but um, the thing that catches people is the large inflorescence, right? And so um, the majority of reports we get of the, for introduced Phragmites are of the native. And second to that, it, I, I would say the reports are shared equally between the pampas grass and immature reed canary grass. And so um, immature reed canary grass, um, the, the immature columns are, are quite erect, similar to the Phragmites with, with uh, kind of a, the stiff leaf. Um, and, and, you know, it, it can be easily mis-ID. All you have to do is wait a month or so for, for the mature plant and you see that, I mean, the size is, is very, very different. Um, one, one good way to tell the difference between um, the invasive versus the introduced Phragmites is that the invasive Phragmites will actually persist year round as a dense cluster of standing dead stems, whereas the native Phragmites actually sheds the blades after it has senesced each year. So where is Phragmites in BC? Um, we currently have a total of 10 introduced Phragmites sites in BC. Um, They're located one in the Victoria area, three in the Metrovan area, one of which is, uh, we will be declaring that it's eradicated quite soon. Um, there is one in the Okanagan Smilk Mean area in a Soyuz, and it's worth mentioning with this one, if any of you guys are from that area, there is a massive population of native Phragmites in, um, at the north end of the a Soyuz estuary. Um, um, at the north end of the lake, um, and only one comb out of all of those, and we sampled all of them. Only one is the is the came out as the introduced genotype. So we are treating that one, but it does raise some very interesting questions about the genetics and potential hybridizing in that area, and that's something that we're we're looking into. There are three sites in um, the North Okanagan area, just uh, north of Vernon. Uh, one just outside of Kamloops and Thompson Nicola, and then one in the central Kootenai. And um, that one we're still waiting on the DNA analysis for. So what are we doing about Phragmites? We've drafted the risk assessment. We, we did a, a provincial DNA verification project um, that was done mainly back in 2013 in partnership with the Royal BC Museum and the University of Victoria. And in that project, um, we sampled, uh, we collected uh, and pressed uh, a sample of Phragmites from every single clone 
that uh, we were aware of in the province. That there were more than 200 of them done. And uh, the DNA was analyzed and sequenced on every single one of them. And that then presented us with the list of um, the 10 introduced sites versus all of the others, which are, which are native. Um, and it's also um, provided us with some very interesting information, which is summarized in um, a publication that was put out in the Wetlands uh, magazine in May 2017. And the primary author on that is Geraldine Allen from UVic. And that's distributional and morphological differences between native and introduced common reed in Western Canada. So an interesting read. Um, there's a lot of research being done on this, um, th this genus. Um, well, I guess the species, but that there, there's a lot going on with that one. So um, if you're into genetics, um, definitely worth a read. So bringing us on to our next species, uh, jointed go grass. Um, this is a relatively new species to the province. Um, it is native to Southeast Europe and Western Asia. It's a winter annual grass. It has um, numerous erect stems branching at the base, uh, standing 40 to 60 centimeters tall. Um, alternate leaves, um, sparsely hairy. The hairs are evenly spaced on the leaf margin. As you can see in the far right image, um, it's quite orderly, which is nice. And um, the oracle, which is, try my arrow again. The oracle, which is right about here, is, uh, is hairy. And that's kind of an unusual feature, so something to look for. So what is it? Um, it has a very narrow cylindrical seed heads, uh, about five to 10 centimeters long each, and they alternate, um, uh, they're arranged alternately on the spikelet on opposite sides. So at this image here on the right, you can see here's one, here's one. So they're really compact, hey? Really quite nice looking. Uh, the roots are shallow and fibrous. Um, they can cause significant losses in winter wheat crop yield and quality. Um, it, so jointed goat grass can be difficult con to control in wheat because it's genetically related. The two species have similar growth habits and they're known to cross pollinate each other. So obviously this is problematic. Um, it reproduces by seed spread mainly in contaminated cereal, cereal crops and the seeds um, remain viable after they pass through cattle. So in the, the lower image um, on the left side, that's a picture of the jointed goat grass spikes and on the right, that's the winter wheat. Um, so the inflorescence is quite distinct, but you know, if you're looking at a large crop, it can be kind of tricky to tease out the joint to go grass. Okay, and so um, this is a table that we've created um, just as a quick reference for telling the difference between the two. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. Um, there's more information in our invasive species alerts on our webpage and um, and also on the Canada Food Inspection Agency website because this is a federally regulated species as well. So I'm just gonna keep moving on with this one. So where is jointed goat grass in BC? Um, at the start of 2019, I'll say in May, 2019, there was um, only one known site in Duncan in the Cowshin Valley in, on Southern Vancouver Island. And in 2019, that site was declared eradicated because it, it went the, the amount of time required with no, no presence. Um, and that was from a rail yard. But in 2019, actually, um, with the reports that came in on the North African grass, um, just by accident, they happened to mention the jointed goat grass sites that they come across too. And so um, there were four sites mentioned. Well, one site was sort of offhandedly mentioned to me initially, and that caused further, you know, questions. And then then they provided four sites. This was uh, from botanist and. You know, the botanists of BC are so hugely helpful because what they see on the landscape, you know, the level of detail that they see is quite different compared to the rest of us. And so there's a treasure trove of information for, for plant um, plant locations. Um, and also, as we followed up on those new four sites, two additional sites were discovered. So there are, um, there are four sites currently confirmed in the Okanagan Smilkameen area and two in the boundary region. Okay, sorry, I'm just going to, can you hear me all right? Sorry, we're just gonna get the audio first. 
Let's play the game. We're going to have to try to run with that. OK, so we'll keep going then. Um, Sensors for dry goat grass are in progress. Um, new introductions to BC will be associated with grain transport pathways, such as rail lines, long haul trucks, um, or range expansion from affected areas in Washington, Idaho, and Montana. Okay, so what are we doing about joint grass? It is a federally regulated pest under the Canada Plant Protection Act. It's also um, prohibited under the Wood Seed Order, so 16 under the Federal Seeds Act. So importation and domestic movement of regulated plants and their reproductive parts are prohibited. So the Canada Food Inspection Agency is leading the response to new incursions in Canada, and we're working closely with them on that. So as new reports come in to me, I then pass them on to CFIA, and um, we ensure that there is a coordinated rapid response. So to date, um, the risk assessment has been drafted. The extent surveys are in progress. Um, the sites have been verified by um, the province. Um, the, the CFIA is still in the process of, of making site visits and eradication was declared for that site in the Couch and Valley. And uh, on the picture on the left, um, that's a picture of winter wheat uh, underneath the seeds of the jointed goat grass. So you can see the jointed goat grass um, are, are quite a bit larger. So giant reed, this is the last species we'll be going into in detail. Um, Arundo donax, so it's native to warm temperate Asia. It's a tall perennial grass, uh, up to 10 meters tall. So this is definitely qualifies as a giant grass. It, it's a, it has a hollow bamboo-like column or stem, uh, one to four centimeters in diameter. Um, I, the nodes, which are, here I'll grab my arrow again. The nodes, which are right here, in between those hollow sections, they're an average of 12 to 30 centimeters apart, and there's a fleshy um, rhizome underneath. So new introductions on the landscape would be very noticeable to someone who's frequenting a given area. Um, in 2017, all cultivars um, were determined by the Canada Food Inspection Agency to share the equal level of risk for invasiveness, invasiveness to Canada. So this is significant because it, it is an, an ornamental used in some cultivated settings. And um, there were some questions about whether there was a variability in aggressiveness between the different cultivars. So CFI has confirmed that yes, in fact, they are all equally aggressive and all should be uh, treated in the same way. Um, at this point, there are not, um, there are no giant reed, there, there are no giant reed, oh, I can't talk anymore. There are no more giant reed sites known to occur out of cultivation in BC. So if you happen to know of one, please do let me know. We very much appreciate it. Okay, giant reed. So it's got a, a pale green um, leaf blades, uh, very long, seven, uh, 70 centimeters long. They're arranged alternately along the comb and they're distinctly two ranked on a single plane. So it, it's they're quite organized and orderly as you can see in, in the picture on the left. The leaves clasp the stem broadly and actually the image on the right has a, a really nice um, picture of the sheath. So the sheath is the part that that um, attaches itself to the comb or the stem. And so um, that area where you can see, let me my arrow again. This area right here is often described as, as heart-shaped. It's quite a distinct shape right there. And the um, oracle, which is right here is, is hairy or tufted, which again is, is quite a distinct feature. It has a large plume-like panicle, which is the flower at the top, right? 30 to 65 centimeters long. And it can appear cream to brown in color, which is quite variable, right? So that you wanna keep that in mind when you're developing a search image for this one, that you know what you see in this image here might not be exactly what you're seeing on the landscape. Certainly the structure of the plant form would be the same, 
but the colorings could be a bit different. Okay, so where is it in British Columbia? As I said before, it's not known to occur out of cultivation in BC or in Canada overall. There's one reported wholesale retailer in the Fraser Valley that I'm aware of, and that's being followed up on. Um, uh, we're aware of it being used as an ornamental in some situations down in the Southwest, and that's why I circle the sort of South area. We're still in the term that's up there. Um, we're not sure that it's used for Hi, folks. It's Sue uh, Staniforth here. Sorry so much about the uh, the connection. I think um, Becky, her connection co keeps coming in and out on her internet, so that's why we're getting such garbled sound. I'm hoping, Becky, that it comes back again. Uh, we really can't hear you now, um, every, but every third word comes through. But um, well, we'll keep trying. As we as we say, we've we're we will be posting this presentation later, but um, let's hang on and see if we can get this going again. Moving on. So what are we doing about giant reed? It is um, federally regulated by the Plant Protection Act. Um, it's not regulated by the Weed Seeds Act because it's not thought to be very effective at, at spreading by seed. Um, and so the Canada Food Inspection Agency is, is leading the response for, for this species. A risk assessment has been drafted, extent surveys have been completed by the province. And as I mentioned before, where we're aware of it in cultivation, we've requested that those plants be removed. And there's a link at the bottom of this slide to the CFIA page for giant reed. So some more species um, that might be of interest to you that are not yet known to occur in BC. And actually at the time of the slide being made, that was the case. Uh, I've since become aware of um, three Johnson grass voucher collections that were made some years ago. And I'm in the process of following up on those. But here are two examples of um, species close to the BC's border. Um, Johnson grass is, is the one on the left. And then, um, which is a federally regulated species as well. And then Medusa head, which is on the right. So um, the Johnson grass is known to occur in Washington and Idaho. And um, I, I recently became aware of, of uh, vouchers that had been collected in one in Nanaimo and two in the lower mainland. So I am following up on those. For the Medusa head, um, that's the image on the right. Um, it is present at the Boundary Dam project site and Kaminko Mine property in Ponderay, Washington which is less than 100 kilometers south of the border. So there is a chance that it could come up through the border there. Okay, two other species of concern close to the border. Again, these are both federally regulated grasses, um, which is just uh, a fluke. Uh, slender fox tail um, is not, present, not known to be present in North America um, currently. Although actually depending, yeah. Um, and then the spring millet grass is um, is known to be present, not not known to be present in Canada yet, it is known to be present in the U.S. but not in any adjacent uh, counties. It, it, there there is a site in there are some sites in Idaho though. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on these um, just for the sake of time, but they're here for your reference. Now, how can you help? Um, you can learn how to identify invasive plants. 
Um, I mean, I'm sure many of you know how to identify all kinds of plants already. Um, it, you know, if you're able to, to learn how to identify the five main grasses that we've talked about in this PowerPoint and, and submit reports when you see these, that would be massive. That would be fantastic, even just to focus on those five. Um, if you're doing any sort of large scale seeding, screen your seed mixtures before you, before you purchase the seed. Report suspected new sites um, to the province. So there's a link there um, and that link will take you to several different options reporting. There's reporting, mapping, um, you name it. Um, wherever possible, don't plant invasive um, species. And stay informed of being part of this webinar. Part of that. Um, the thing with the seed screening I want to mention is you know, it not only helps us to prevent introduction, but also helps to in managing the objectives and managing your land. That style. Um, in conclusion, we've talked about what ER is, um, the status of your program, see as of today, new invasive so species in the land, both in the province and, and not yet in the province. Bullet about coastal grasses. Sorry, I'm going to take that out at a time. I, have, I, I do not look at the most valuable weapon in the day. Um, but interesting grasses and answers, but there's. And then you can become part of the solution, and that's the best thing you can do when participating in the event today is a big step towards that. So thank you everybody for um for joining the webinar on both your education our question. audio. Um, hoping I'm coming in clear, a little bit clearer. Um, we will get to the questions in a minute and hopefully we can get through them with, with good sound. As I said earlier, this webinar has been approved for one continuing education credit towards pesticide applicator certification, which is great. For those of you wanting to collect this credit, please add your applicator number into the chat box. Um, and if you don't have one or it's not handy, please write that in the chat box as well. And then you can email it in later to communications at bcinvasive.ca. I'll get uh, Brittany to put that email in the chat box. So to the questions, I'll start uh, with the first question and work my way through until we reach one o'clock. Um, and as I said, if there's not enough time to get through all the questions, we'll send out the answers by email. So I'll just wait for the first one to, to pop up. And this one came from Facebook and Julie Chelsea says, how do you decide when something is under containment? I understand you identify sites and can measure and control, control growth, but a lot of private lands are not managed for invasives and public land reaches far and wide. Is it classified as contained or eradicated until a new site is identified? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, how it works is, um, with any given species, uh, a report, say, say it's a new species to the province and we receive our first two new, new reports of that species. And so we go out to each of those sites, we verify that in fact, it is the species that's been reported and it is an ER species. Then um, we, we complete the extent survey, which means identifying everywhere from the, with, with the, that, that confirmed site becomes the center of the site. And then we radiate out from there, um, uh, identifying every spot where that plant occurs um, until we go for, you know, depending on the species, that'll sort of dictate how far we go of no weed found before we would say, okay, yes, we found the perimeter. But essentially we're dropping pins, like, sorry, pins on our iPads, wherever we're seeing that plant. And, and you know, you can see on the map, it starts forming, you know, a polygon. And once we have gone, radiated out from that center point for, you know, it, it's in this case for extent surveys, probably you could say 200 meters, but then it depends on what kind of, uh, what the vector is, what the pathways are, what the plant is and how it spreads. That would sort of influence how far we would go before we would confirm, um, you know, we have to go 200 meters or whatever uh, of no weed found before we'd say, yes, in fact, we found the perimeter of that site. 
Okay, so when we're talking about extent surveys, you do you complete an extent survey for each individual site, not each individual species. If you have two sites of one species, you're going to do an extent survey at each of those sites. You're going to delineate the perimeter of that site for each of those sites, and then you will contain that site by treating the perimeter and moving inward towards the center of the site. Um, and, and you have containment when you know that it's not spreading outside of that identified perimeter. And the perimeter will ideally shrink over time, the extent will shrink over time, and repeated extent surveys following treatments uh, will confirm to you that you, have, you are physically containing it, which means that it is not spreading outside of that one confined site. Does that answer your question, hopefully? more minutes to go through a few more questions? Sure. All right. So we'll put another one up there. Um, interesting because you did address the Medusa head. Um, so it looks like it is on the radar. Um, Jessica says it's been a big issue south of the border. Do you want to comment further on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned it as a, a species that is, it's been identified as a, an EDR candidate species. It's, it has not yet been identified in British Columbia. We know that it is close to the border um, and we know what the likely introduction points will be and the likely vectors. And so we are focusing primarily on those and doing periodic checks on uh, sites associated with those vectors and pathways. And so far there has been no Medusa head identified in British Columbia, but we encourage reports. Great, awesome. Lisa Scott uh, has a question saying, there was no potential BC range map shown for Ventanata. Is there a map? I'm just going back, taking a look here. Uh -huh. the potential range, yes, we do have a potential range map. I didn't include it in this PowerPoint because I had already had lots of slides in here. But yes, there there is, there is a range map for that. And uh, the majority of the province is susceptible. Okay. Thanks, we'll go to the next question. This is from Saba. What is the total hectare of area covered um, of this Phragmite species in BC, the invasive one, I'm assuming? Right, so this is a great question because, um, so we have our 10 confirmed sites of the introduced Phragmites, and it is, oh gosh, it's probably less than, uh, less than a quarter hectare in total area. So that the sites are, are discrete, they are small. Good news. All right, uh, question from Christina. How much does DNA verification typically cost, for example, uh, you know, to, to uh, identify Phragmites? Yeah, um, so it depends on the size of the project. So the more samples that are being processed, the, the cheaper your processing rate per sample. Um, we were processing, gosh, I think, our first batch was, I think, 125 samples, and I think um, the actual DNA analysis was, I think it was $300 per sample. But so that's just the sequencing, though, right? So, so there is the sample prep. So we, we, I mean, our group collected the 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 leaf tissue, right, and then it would go to the lab at UVic, and then they would prep the the. Um, the, the sample for the sequencing and the sequencing was actually done outside of their lab. So there's, I mean, there's kind of a whole bunch involved in that. Um, and you wouldn't, um, there's not like a, a setup in place where you could collect one sample, send it off to a lab and, and they'll just process one sample and they'll charge you 300 bucks. Like that's, that setup doesn't exist. So we, we initiate a project with UVic when we have a sample size that's large enough to warrant the project. Um, the initial project was went over two years and it was, you know, because it was province wide and, and we knew that there would be a large number of samples, you know, it, it warranted that effort. And now we have maybe a handful of additional samples that, that we're getting organized and we'll do like a small batch analysis. But it's not the kind of thing where you just submit one sample to a, some random lab and they would do it for you. I'm sure you could find people who are willing to do it online, but um, for us through the province, that's the route we go. It's worth mentioning too that the sequences for the genetic sequences for different species or subspecies haven't necessarily been identified either. I mean, people need to do research to identify what what those sequences are in order to 
to do the analysis. So with, with the Sphragmites, we're fortunate in that it, that work has been done already by researchers. But, you know, if it comes to the question of there being new hybrids, well, there's no sequence to identify those yet. So that's why, you know, it's sort of a work in progress. Mm, interesting. Thanks, Becky. That's great. We'll see another a couple of questions. Allison asks, has the Phragmites along Island Road north of Oliver been, identif been identified as native or introduced? Yeah, that's uh, native. Ah, good, good, good news. And a question from Dawn. Uh, bulbous bluegrass has moved into the South Okanagan very rapidly and it likes the same disturbed habitats that cheatgrass does. I'm curious there's, if there's any concern about the future spread of this species. Well, it's a good question. I mean, my focus has been mainly on um, new species to the province, and I'm not actually familiar with what the status of of uh, bulbous bluegrass is. Um, I can get back to you on that, actually. I mean, I'd have to follow up and check on that. Um, but I mean, that's not on my radar, but I can definitely do a scan and, and see where things are at on that. Okay. Great. One more question from Corey Weiss. This is a Facebook from Facebook. What areas of BC are lacking data of invasive species? I imagine most areas that are visited by humans are research, but is it worth doing research in remote areas of BC, such as such as lakes that are fly-in only and higher up in the watershed? It's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's actually surprising sometimes where there are vouchers collected. Botanists are very prolific in getting to some really far out places. And I would say the same for our forest researchers as well. Um, they're often flying into areas, whether it's lakes or forests or mountaintops making collections, which makes it kind of tricky for us to follow up. Um, but, you know, it, it depends on the species really, right? Um, I mean, I, I know several folks or myself as well, and we've done collections in extremely remote areas. So it, it really depends on, on a given project. I mean, we don't have, I wouldn't say we have complete base mapping for all alpine areas for invasive species in the province, but I mean, we, we have a really broad baseline for aquatic plants in the province. And we have, I think, a, a really good idea for, for most invasive plants in the province, actually. I mean, in most cases, the, the elevational range is, is gonna be limited to some degree with, with most invasive plants. There are some where that's not the case, but uh, I think our coverage is actually pretty good, but it's not complete. <laughs> Great, yeah, and that's, that's why it's so important to have um, industry folks, resource industry folks on the ground that um, that can help us with that too, as well as recreationists and you know people out in those in those places. So great. Okay, um, I, I just don't I don't want to keep you too long, Becky. Let's just do one this one more question, um, and we can um, send you if you wouldn't mind the rest of the questions. I think there's a couple more um, to answer by email. This one is from Sean, and he's saying, "I'm wondering what the concern with Phragmites is, given how similar it is to a native species." Presumably native biocontrols would use both equally. Right, okay, so um, uh, natural predators for native Phragmites um, have, have not been shown to predate on the introduced Phragmites, for starters. Um, we're in the process of identifying potential biocontrol agents for the introduced Phragmites, um, which would be um, obviously uh, unique and isolated to the introduced Phragmites, so they would not feed on the native Phragmites. Um, the concern about the introduced Phragmites is that um, it, it does behave more aggressively. Um, it, it forms monocultures. It spreads rapidly, more rapidly than native Phragmites. Um, and where it does occur, um, it uptakes a very significant amount of water um, and then you get all the, the regular sort of impacts associated with invasive plants mm -hmm. as well. Um, it, you know, the, the best folks to talk to about what, what inv invasive Phragmites can do are in Ontario, you know, for Canada. They have um, continual kilometer after kilometer along their highways of introduced Phragmites, and it moves into, you know, sensitive areas as well, and it forms a monoculture, obviously. So I, it, 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 it's absolutely um, uh, an ecosystem shifter. Incredible, I've seen it there. It is unbelievable <laughs> how much there is. So I've been told by Brittany, we have one more question. So hopefully um, we're not keeping you too, too long, Becky. Higgs Porter from Facebook asks, what can be done for overgrazing from livestock? 
Right. So range management is not my area of expertise. We have many um, range specialists um, within our branch that could answer that question much better than myself. And they work with um, which all, with all the range tenures in, in the province, um, and they would be much better suited to answer that question. Great. I mean, obviously, grazing less in a given area and rotating around is a good idea, right? But that, that's very simplistic. Right. I'm sure there's a broader answer that could be given. <laughs> we can maybe um, direct them, direct uh, Higgs to our website as well. That'd be great. We have a bit of information on that. All right. Well, Bucky, I wanted to thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today on behalf of the council and everybody that's listening. Um, wonderful presentation. We'll be sending out a short link to an evaluation survey to all of you, and we'd love you to fill it out so we can get your feedback and ideas for future webinars. I wanted to remind folks that May is officially proclaimed as Invasive Species Action Month in BC, and it's coming up fast. We've got some great webinars coming up weekly during May, as well as a photo contest and some great resources. Check out our website as well as bcinvasivesmonth.com to check that, uh, check out that information. Um, Becky, do you have anything further to say? Uh, no, thanks very much. Hopefully the audio uh, is eligible. Yes, I hope so too. Thanks very much, folks, and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.